The Hyundai has its good days, it really does. just that all too often its bad days occur right in the middle of the good days. It wasn't inconsistent like this when it was originally given to me, so whatever's wrong with it is clearly something that I've done to it. So I guess I have something to own up to. Here I am leaving Bernie's after a lunchtime gut grenade, and the Hyundai begins picking and choosing which cylinders it wants to run on. It just can't seem to make up its mind. Four? Two? I don't know. I already knew it had electrical problems, and I wanted to catch them on video so that I could share them with all of you. So I guess today's my lucky day. I had largely put this car down for a while to work on old Whitey and Foofy. I drove it to work a few times since my hypothesized diagnosis to keep the fluid circulated, and it was a tremendous threat to my job security every time for completely different reasons. It did, however, always manage to get me back home again. It's tremendous fun and there's never a dull moment, but it's obvious that this car is not yet ready for prime time. It's breeding gremlins that are largely unheard of in any other car but this one. Originally, I just had some issues with the data and the logs, some inconsistencies in power output, and when it would knock, but then it started doing this. Try to jump it. Nothing. Of course, right in the middle of an intersection. This car wants me dead. This is my favorite place ever to play mechanic because gorgeous women run through this neighborhood all the time and this is exactly how I wish to be seen. Doing manly mechanic things. Because nothing says manly like a bearded quadragenarian in a work shirt with no tools broken down in the middle of an intersection with his unidentifiable 25 year old flat red four door economy car. In reality, all I'm doing is reaching behind the engine and shaking the wiring harness. That's all I'm doing. Grab here, shake it. Grab there, shake it. Ladies, don't be fooled. That's all your man's actually doing. He doesn't have a clue what's broken. He's just grabbing and shaking stuff. Notice the confidence level. I'm closing the hood before I start it. Come on, Jaffro. You get three minutes to get back to work from lunch. Anyway, in a previous video, you saw me document at the track how one minute it gives me a clean, trouble-free pull, and the next pass, nothing changes except for the time of day, and then everything's all out of whack. Fuel mixture's wrong, throttle position, idle voltage wanders around, sometimes it knocks and sometimes it doesn't, but more often than not, it knocks. I also demonstrated a method of diagnosis in that video by turning the key on with the engine off and starting a log. I did a rudimentary buckshot diagnosis with a data logger instead of using a multimeter, and I made my best guess of what the problem was without getting dirty by comparing what I saw in the log to an electrical diagram of a 90 turbo DSM. I can't believe I didn't get one single THAT'S A BULLSH TEST BECAUSE YOU CAN'T READ OHMS WITH A DATA LOGGER post. Really, it's just another way for me to demonstrate why ECM Link is so awesome for a DSM engine management system. I focused on the circuits of the affected sensors to point me in the right direction. Then five months ago, I made a prediction of where I was likely to find resistance problems. Of course, you're not going to pinpoint the nature of an electrical problem without a multimeter, but you first have to know where to start looking. Let's watch that short clip again, where I predicted it. It's got a ton of meat in it. The throttle position signal wire is pin 19 on the ECU. That's the input pin that's showing up in the logs as TPS volts. The throttle position sensor is actually powered by the ECU from a 5 volt output on pin number 23. That power output forks to supply power to both the mass airflow sensor and the throttle position sensor. The throttle position sensor also shares a ground with the mass airflow sensor, but it shares a ground with the engine coolant temperature sensor and the EGR temperature sensor as well. Those terminate at pin 24 and 17 at the ECU. The throttle position sensor acts as a potentiometer. It's a variable resistor with a constant hot and ground and an output wire whose voltage changes based off of its location on a resistor coil. That's why the diagram has a resistor with an arrow on it. If its input voltage or its ground resistance changes, then so does its output. So it's important to look at all the connections to the affected components. If I experienced a short to ground or a short to power or a bad connection on any one of these circuits, then it will backfeed and change the voltage across the throttle position sensor's resistor coil, ultimately affecting its output voltage. That's what I'm seeing here in the logs. 
So this is the reason why my tuning difficulties are continuing even after fixing all of my previous airflow issues. That's really putting myself out there. All I did was plug in a USB cable. I never unplugged a connector or did any other tests, but then I went and made a video about it. Okay, well now I'm going to finally dig into it. Now I'm going to use a multimeter. Now I'm going to remove and reinstall the engine harness, and now I'm going to show you the right way to fix your electrical problems if I can. I didn't want to shoot this, I didn't want to edit it, and I didn't want to narrate it. I'm not an electrician, heck, I'm not even a photographer or an audio engineer either. This is just my hobby. Electrical work is not my favorite thing to do. I'd rather put foot pegs and handlebars on a solid fuel rocket and hold on, because there's no electrical stuff to break. We're talking Wiley e. Coyote style. But so many people asked about the troubleshooting and repair that I went ahead and filmed the rest of the troubleshooting process. I knew my diagnosis was only an informed guess. It's a tight fit back here, so I'm going to have to explain some of what I'm doing where the camera doesn't fit. I started by unplugging all the connectors from the components on the circuits that I'm testing, as well as from the ECU. You want everything unplugged because components on a closed circuit can add resistance that wouldn't be there if it were open. Because my original diagnosis included only the coolant temperature sensor, mass airflow sensor, throttle position sensor, and EGR temperature sensor, I'll start there. I've got my main battery and alternator connections disabled at the breakers because fire. And I've got the ECU disconnected because short circuit and because fry. These yellow connectors are the ECU connectors. If you remember from the diagram, the shared ground was a green wire with a black stripe on it and those were pins number 17 and 24 on the ECU. There are diagrams in the service manual, VFAC, and on the ECM tuning website to help you determine pin locations on these connectors. Now I'm going to bust out this Fluke 88V with butterfly probes so that I can make good contact hands-free while testing all the assembled connectors. When I reference the service manual's diagrams to find out their pin numbers, it also shows that I've got this green and black wire in the right places on this connector. When you're doing this, locate both the pin numbers and the wire colors before cutting wires because it can be difficult to determine which side of the connector you're looking at on the drawing. Wire colors will help you straighten that out. Now that I've got the probe in pin number 17 on the ECU, I'm going for the throttle position sensor ground wire on the connector in the engine bay. The green and black wire is what I'm looking for on this connector. It's hard to get an angle on it with the camera, but you're going to have to take my word for it that this is the one I'm cramming the butterfly probe in. Already I'm getting ridiculous numbers for resistance. The healthiest circuit you can ask for is 0.2 ohms, not 27. Whoa. Look what happens when I move the connector around. I'm just raising it and lowering it. See? My manly grab it and shake it method of roadside repair has merit after all. But this is just horribly bad. That's what's been interfering with my tuning. I find it insane that I went straight for the problem based off nothing but a log, an electrical diagram, and a guess. I have a bad ground on my TPS circuit. No matter how lucky I was to hit this problem on the first try, it's important to split the circuit and test every endpoint to help you pinpoint where in the circuit that you're going to find your problem. This ground wire connects in five different locations and components. What I mean by split the circuit is to move the probes around the engine harness to isolate which connector or connectors you're having a problem with. So from the same pin 17 at the ECU, we're going to find the green and black ground wire on the MAF sensor connector which has been cut and soldered multiple times to convert it from a 1G to a 2G mass airflow sensor and back. And see if we can get the same behavior since it's further down on the circuit. 0.6 ohms. I mean, that's not great, but it's a whole lot less than 27 or 400 like we were seeing on the throttle position sensor plug. Now let's wiggle it around a little. Nothing changes. See, this is the green and black wire. Now I'm going to wiggle the engine harness by the TPS harness plug and see what happens. Nothing. Oop, a tenth of an ohm. I think it's just teetering on the edge. I don't think it's really changing. It's not reacting directly to these movements. I don't have the same problem with the mass airflow sensor portion of the ground circuit. That's good because the math plug is on the longest stretch of wires on the harness. Let's check the green and black ground wire on pin 24 of the ECU connector and see if we get the same behavior. Hmm. 
Looks like I have 0.8 ohms on the math plug now. Wiggle the TPS portion of the harness. Nothing. That's the same behavior as we saw from the other ECU pen. So now let's go back to the TPS connector again and see if it still does it. And yes, it does. It seems to be less pronounced than the other pen, and I'm not sure why yet. So we've got two strikes on the throttle position sensor circuit. Okay, I'm going to speed things up a bit here. You get the idea. Now we need to test the coolant temperature sensor side of the circuit. 0 0.8, 0 0.9 ohms. Again, that's kind of high, but pretty normal for a 25-year-old thrice reused import engine harness. I've at least got continuity anyway, and it's consistent. Now is a good time to test the continuity of the actual green and white throttle position signal wire to the ECU pin number 19. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, down from 24, green and white. Let's see if it's part of that failed circuit. This wire isn't shared with anything. It's got a straight shot at the ECU. Green and white wire on the throttle position plug. And it says 0.3 ohms. Wiggle it around a little. And nothing. Nope. Nothing. Solid. Still not happy with solid. Keep shaking and trying to make it fail. Nope. Solid. I'm still not happy stopping there with just this test. So to satisfy my curiosity about the MAF signal, I'm testing pin 16 on the ECU, which is the barometric signal wire input. It's a green and yellow wire. So here we go again on the math plug. Find the green and yellow wire. Pokety poke. 0.4 ohms. Shake the harness. Solid. No change. Good barometric signal wire. I have bad ground on one leg of a five-way circuit that happens to be shared with the MAF sensor. No ECU codes, but that's because the sensors are actually still working. So I've got a good TPS signal wire, good barometric signal wire, good continuity on the grounds for the coolant temperature sensor, mass airflow sensor, and both of the ECU pins. I've just got one bad leg of that five-way ground circuit, and it's only on the TPS harness. In order to see what's really going on, I have to remove the engine wiring harness and dig into all the shielding and convoluted tubing so that I can find the point of failure. At least I know where to look. Also while I'm going through here, there's something else that's always been bothering me. It mostly involves how badly a DSM engine harness fits in an Elantra. So I'm going to change a few things and move some parts around. I'm also going to find the boost control solenoid wires because I'm afraid I may have cut them off when I removed other unnecessary plugs. I've been meaning to add an Ingersoll Rand boost control solenoid to this thing that I can enable gear-based boost control and regulate it with ECM link. I would have given it its own video, except that nobody other than me will find installing this thing in their car to be as difficult as I've got it. Well, there it is. There's the problem with my throttle position sensor ground wire. It's got a copper band crimped around the short 10-inch section of wire that attaches it to the rest of those ground circuits. While it feels tight, this is what's making a bad connection. To prevent this thing from slipping or moving around, I'm just going to completely solder over it to add a conductive filler that locks it in place. I'm also going to move the injector resistor pack harness down on the main harness so that it extends its reach to the resistor pack. I'm doing the same thing with the TPS sensor harness as well and retaping the wires so that if the harnesses get tugged, it places no stress on the rest of the harness. Even though I didn't have any problems with a MAF sensor signal and ground wires, I want to take a better look at this leg of the circuit because I remember cutting all these cruise control and unnecessary solenoid wires off, and I think this might have been where the boost control solenoid wires were located. If I'm right, it's going to be one of these wires. According to the wiring diagram in the service manual, it's supposed to be an orange wire and a red wire that completes its circuit. Here I find a suspicious red wire with another one of those unshielded clamp things and no wire attached to it. 
Red is usually power, and this is going to the mass airflow plug. And looky here, I've got an orange wire. According to the electrical diagram, the red one branches from the MPI circuit, and the orange one goes to pin 105 on the ECU. Let's see if this orange wire is the one for pin 105. Bingo! That's the one. Well, that simplifies things from the engine bay side since I don't have to pass a wire through the firewall for this anymore. And yet, even more good news, I don't have to worry about the polarity on a boost control solenoid because the ECU switches the solenoid on by pulling current to ground. The solenoid just completes that circuit. The red wire on the MAF connector, pin number 3, is the MPI power circuit, and it happens to be the one with that crimp thing on it. Before I assume that that's it and continue, I'm going to make sure that none of the other wires in this bundle share a connection to the MPI circuit. Nope, they don't. I'm just going to take an extremely long section of red 18 gauge wire, longer than I need it, and solder it in between the orange pin 105 wire and the MAF sensor's MPI power circuit. I believe I have solved the mystery of that red wire with the unshielded crimp thingy on it. But before I fix that, I feel like fabricating something. Something functional that removes some of the ugliness and clutter from my engine bay. This hideous riveted in plate that used to house a fuse holder no longer serves a practical purpose. It's a leftover relic of a good idea that was employed to hold up a bad idea. After drilling out the old plate, I use it as a template for the new plate that will allow me to easily secure the resistor pack to the firewall because it's the right size and shape, and it already has all the holes in the right place. This seems like a silly thing to document with a harness repair, but it's related to this fix because the previous location of the resistor pack put a strain on the harness. That in turn put a strain on a different connector. A lack of threaded holes or bracketry on my firewall only offered me the ability to secure the resistor pack with one bolt in a bad spot. The new plate is going to let me move the resistor pack closer to its plug on the harness, cover up the rivet holes for the useless plate I just drilled out, and also let me use both bolts to secure the resistor pack to the firewall. This is too thin of a piece of metal to tap for threads, and you've seen me remedy this in the past by welding a couple of nuts on the back side of the hole. There are several other ways to do it, and they each have their own place. One of them is a riv nut. Some people call them nut certs. It's the same idea, it all depends on who make them as to what they're called. Riv nuts or nut certs are pre-threaded rivets. Unlike pop rivets, they don't have a beaded stud that breaks off once full compression is achieved. They're crushed into a hole using a special tool that uses the threads built into the rivet to deliver their compression force. The goal is not to squish the rivet until it goes pop. That would be bad. You want to stop before that happens. So in order to avoid that, you have to do two things right. One is to have the right size dies for the size and thread for the threaded inserts you're using, and the other is to set the tool up in the proper range to give you the right leverage and range of motion to fully and securely seat the inserts into your materials. The dies come in match sets that screw to the threaded ram on the tool. Then there's a bit of barrel rigging that lifts and elevates an anvil surface which protrudes around the ram giving it a surface to work against. If you tighten the barrel rigging down too far, you won't get good range of motion with the tool. It works as a pull type tool. If you put it too far out, you may not be able to fully engage the threads on your inserts. You can fine tune its operation in a production environment to generate the perfect force and range of motion but since I just need to fasten two M6 inserts onto my part, I'm setting it up for maximum range. You want to set it up so that there's enough rebound, but when you honk it down all the way, you've got a little extra room to put some stank on it. After you've drilled the right size hole, you pop the insert in, thread the tool into it, and fully crush it to make the rivet grab the inside of the hole. Each insert has an unthreaded section that extends about a quarter of an inch down the rivet and is externally grooved to give it traction in the hole as well as to compress the insert evenly around the back side of the hole. That grooved section is what's responsible for making the threaded section beyond it stay put. Let's do that again with the Super Extreme HD close-up. Yeah, this is totally somewhere that I could have welded a couple of nuts on, but this was easier. In fact, it's almost always easier, but you'll see me do it both ways. So that's it with a quick pass on the wire wheel to clean all the rust and scale off, and now I need to squirt some paint on it. I put the bolts in to keep paint out of the threads, and fortunately it only takes 20 seconds for paint to dry in my garage.
I noticed that the firewall was bulged out a bit, so I used some of those 20 seconds with a body hammer to flatten that section back out again. Then I decided it wouldn't hurt at all to use a ball peen hammer to dent it in a little. There needs to be clearance for the riv nuts. And wouldn't you know it, it still doesn't fit. There's plenty of threads on the backs of these things, and I won't miss a few of them in order to make clearance enough to mount it. I don't care if the backs of these things are bare metal pressed against the firewall, and I don't recall whether or not the outer portion of this resistor pack needs to be grounded. But in an abundance of caution, I'll ensure that it mounts with good contact to make it ground if it has to. To pull this off, I'm using a rivet and a drill to score the rivet holes, removing the paint and ensuring good metal-on-metal -metal contact at its mounting points. There you go, finished mounting plate. Now to install it. I'm putting all the rivets in place to keep the part lined up. Never mind that the shock of popping the rivet shoots them all out. It's lined up properly, isn't it? There, securely mounted and relocated resistor pack. Now back to that boost control solenoid harness. Where we left off, I was going to solder a wire much longer than I needed to between the orange pin 105 wire and the red MPI power circuit. So to do this, I just strip all the wires involved, get my heat shrink tubing, twist the wires together, install the heat shrink tubing, get my soldering iron hot and clean, and solder these back together. Since there's a crimped connection where the other wire used to be connected, I'm just going to twist a loop around one end of it, then twist it around the other end and solder that joint back together. Now the circuits are bridged, I can add this loop to the wire loom and run it with the other wires to the MAF sensor circuit closer to where it needs to be installed. Once I've got the boost control solenoid mounted where it needs to be, I can cut that extra long wire and terminate my connections wherever they just happen to line up. Now comes the joyous moment where I get to reloom the harness and make it fit correctly. I'm going to cut new sections of convoluted tubing for the changes I made in the locations where each one of these connectors protrudes from the loom. When you do this, instead of taping wires together inside the convoluted tubing, just cram them into the tubing and tape the outside of the tubing, not the wires. This allows you to make repairs more easily in the future. Binding the wires tightly together with tape not only complicates your future troubleshooting efforts, it may actually cause chafing, because thermal expansion causes the copper wires to grow and shrink. An engine bay goes through more extreme temperature shifts than the rest of the world we live in. There's supposed to be a metal clip on some of the engine bay connectors that hold them in place. For instance, the transistor pack. I don't have that clip. One of my friends suggested I use a paper clip. That might have barely worked for somebody once. I suppose you could try it, but not all paper clips are made the same. I had better luck with a one and a half inch crown molding staple because it was made from rigid, flat, cold rolled steel. It also fit perfectly into the flat, square groove on the harness plug. You should use this trick for injector plugs too if you feel like making your own parts instead of finding their replacements. Just make sure you use a hardened, rigid material or else you'll be back here again later fixing the exact same thing. Getting the rest of the loom situated just takes patience. I've got cables, wires, hoses, and components intertwined here because none of this stuff belongs in this chassis. I secured the harness to the fuel return line using zip ties to keep it anchored. Then I just weave everything into its final locations and ensure there's nothing rubbing on anything else. Honestly, it's looking much better here than what it did before. The changes I made to the resistor pack wiring and the cam angle sensor locations on the loom took all the stress off the harness, and I'm a lot more confident that my tuning troubles will soon end. But rather than wait until then, it only makes sense to begin testing my repairs right now to ensure they address the problems that I observed before. So again, I unplug all the connectors on the TPS ground circuit and repeat my tests. I get the multimeter and first test the probes. This is an important troubleshooting step because touching the probes tells you how much resistance your multimeter is adding to the circuit. You can see that these old probe wires aren't perfect. Could be dirt in the connectors or something like that. It seems that the more I move them around, the less pronounced it becomes. If you find a problem with your meter, mess with it until you can get the value to stabilize as much as it can, or else your readings don't really mean much. I'm seeing it vary between 3 and 5 tenths of an ohm, and that's as good as I can get it. But I'm moving on to the testing of the circuits anyways. Once again, we start with the throttle position sensor ground, and then move on to the interior cabin to test pin 17 on the ECU harness. 
It reads between four and six tenths of an ohm. That's within the margin error observed on my meter. Mass airflow sensor plug, reading between five and six tenths of an ohm. This is the EGR temperature sensor harness that we ignored before on our tests because my car isn't equipped with it. I just need to test the green and black ground wire. I'm getting between four and six tenths of an ohm of resistance, which is within the margin error again of my meter. My fixes look solid, and I'm really happy with that. So with that done, I can plug everything back in and wrap this up, except that I still have to finish up with that boost control solenoid. Since I have ECM link, of course I'm not going to use the factory boost control solenoid. For its replacement, I'll be using an Ingersoll Rand three-port solenoid that I bought from ECM tuning. ECM tuning includes three nylon eighth-inch NPT to barbed fitting adapters to make installing it simple. And I've gone and cut some random harness off of the old Fufi motors to put in the Hyundai. It only seems fair considering how much of Fufi's coolness came from this Elantra. I'm going to start by prepping it for installation, starting with the vacuum nipples. It's recommended to use Teflon tape here. I'm content with following those recommendations. This Teflon tape is way too big for this fitting, but I can't find my small roll, so I'm going to make it work. Once all three of those are done, I'm moving on to its electrical connector. There's absolutely nothing difficult about this unless you make it that way. For instance, the Fufi connector strangely has an extra pin on one side that I don't need, and I cut it off. But for the other two pins on this connector, like I mentioned before, it doesn't matter which wire you connect where because the ECU activates this solenoid by pulling it to ground. All the solenoid does is complete the circuit. It acts as a resistor, not a diode. I could have hardwired it, but I tend to try to make the future maintenance easier for myself. I always install the female end of the connector on the harness and the male end on the part. If this creates a discussion in my comments about gender equality or patriarchy or any kind of junk like that, don't be surprised if your posts disappear. Leave my connectors alone, I assure you this is correct. Now let's get to the meat of how this thing works, and it's simple. On a basic three port internal wastegate configuration, the single nipple goes to the wastegate. It's the common port, meaning that it's connected to both of the ports on this other side. This bottom port is connected to the common port when the solenoid is inactive. This is your boost source from the pressurized portion of your intake. In the event that the solenoid fails, this guarantees that you will still make it home on your wastegate spring pressure. The top port is connected to the common port when the solenoid is active. It bleeds off pressure to the wastegate when the ECU makes this circuit live. This connection should wrap to the turbo intake pipe in front of the turbo so that it pulls vacuum when you're making boost. There's a diagram on the label for this thing that doesn't make any sense to me. In fact, it appears to be sideways to me because the intake port is the boost source. The out is the waste gate and the exhaust is the pre-turbo intake dump. But that's probably just coincidence that it all lines up. Another finishing touch, I'm adding a piece of convoluted tubing to the wires to make it look and feel at home with the rest of my engine bay. I also need to find a way to secure it. And those zip ties have worked for me fine in the past. I'm sure there's a better way. It's back to the tape and drill bits. I'm making a tape template of the shape of the sensor and its bolt hole locations and finding a good location in the engine bay where I can bolt it down. After getting my bolt centers straight, I trim off the excess, slap it on a piece of sheet metal, scratch its outline, center punch the holes, and then cut out the new bracket using an angle grinder. Next, I trim all the edges and burrs off with a fine bastard file and drill out the bolt centers with the appropriate size drill bits. I found a box of fasteners that were the perfect diameter and length for the solenoid, but I have no rivnut attachment that matches these threads, so it looks like I've got some welding to do. Using an extra set of the same fasteners that I intend to throw away, I double nut the bolts on both sides of the part, and I'll weld the nuts on the side of the face away from the solenoid. I'm putting way too much heat on this right now, and I don't really care. I'll clean up the slop with a grinder, a hammer, and a rattle can. And there you have it. I have a bracket that I can securely bolt my boost control solenoid down with. Now for a final finish and a rattle can cleanup. I'm going with a stealth black because I don't really want to draw attention to this thing. Here's what the final product looks like. Not too bad. Bolts in securely, easily accessible test button, and its very own harness plug off a of Honda. Thanks, Foofy. Let's mount and install it. Mounted. Now let's get this connector located and installed where this thing needs to be. It's 
Say goodbye to the old manual boost controller. I need to install 3 16th inch line rather than this big hose for the boost source because that's one way these parts differ. But while I'm at it, I'll just replace them all. The wastegate gets connected to common. My new boost source goes to the bottom port. My new solenoid vacuum source goes to the top port. The size difference between the vacuum port on my intake and this hose leaves me with a challenge that I know I'll return to later. There, finished with the boost control solenoid. I noticed that the coolant sensor wires were burned up by the tiny O2 sensor wire harness malfunction from last year. I decided to trim them back and replace the ends where they connect to the sensors. I made these out of some spare wire, female spade connectors, and some shrink tubing. While I could have put another set of butt connectors back onto what I already had until the next time it breaks, this is something I'd rather not have to look at again. There you go, engine bay wiring harness is complete, fixed, ready for round eight. Electrical problems can be a pain to troubleshoot, and the Hyundai's not my only problem child while all of this was going on. In fact, this particular problem child, along with the Hyundai, isn't even a tenth of my troubles. But there are still both logs in the fire. This is a bone stock truck that I've never worked on. I drove to Jamie's house to return his valve spring compressor on a warm spring night, and Big Red hit me with the alarms and a big wrench that read no oil pressure, right in the middle of the cluster. On the return trip, it shut me down on a freeway entrance ramp and it couldn't be restarted. Without a flashlight, tools, or an electrical diagram, I was stuck calling a tow truck. That's the extremely short version of this story. On March 11th, my truck experienced a problem that causes a no-start condition. This specific model FX4 with the 5-liter Coyote has a known issue with fuel pump circuit number 27 burning up in the fuse box and affecting other circuits. I'm not its only victim. There's a part kit that relocates this specific fuse. There's a link in the description about it. This is an unclaimed product defect, and the last sentence of post number 12 is why people like myself don't like dealing with dealerships, yet we still do. There's just no other way to get through to the manufacturer. One way or another, an electrical problem will cost you either your time or your hard-earned money. Sometimes both. All my Hyundai fixes were free because I had the tools and the supplies. That was just my time. But with Big Red? Well, this is just my luck. Somebody should make a video about it. No, really. I wake up every day and I consider that to be extremely lucky. Lucky enough to overcome my challenges and continuously repeat that performance on a daily basis. I'm so lucky that even my luck has its own luck. We're talking overachiever status luck. Yes, I found all of these. This isn't even a quarter of it. I give them all away. But science teaches us that for every force, there is a like and opposite force. Think for a second about how that works out for the incredibly lucky people who enjoy making videos. How that might affect their video production. The best advice I can give you for your troubleshooting theory is this. If you hit something that seems like a roadblock, it's really just an opportunity for you to piss excellence. It's not even a bad thing. Step away from it and do something else to remind yourself just how much excellence you can piss. Find and fix everything in your control to change before you give it a run through your acceptorator. If you do it right, you might just catch this fish. I can quit fishing now. I won the sport. You see that? That's Chad over there pissing excellence. He caught my fish's wife. Both of these were caught from land. This pier is made of 2x8s and they measure 8 inches per plank with the gap. This is a 48 and a 46 inch red drum. Man, Chad's fish is a fatty. We threw both of them back. Both were citations and my state's record for a red drum right now is 49 inches. I was baited and hooked for these little guys with shrimp and a number 2 flicker snell on a bottom rig. I told you I was lucky. Now I can only guess what terrible fate awaits me for enjoying this moment. But really, I'm just lucky enough to have had your attention for this long, and for all these years here, and for all of you who have managed to credit me for any of the excellence that you have pissed. If I could give you anything, it would just be confidence, because trust me, you don't want any of my luck. I'll be back with another video soon, so until next time, 